Okay, get ready for a stargazing night. See what's up into the sky. Got my red flashlight and my sky chart here, my planetsphere, and we've got you watching. So welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today for a little backyard astronomy as we've got the the way the sky is at tonight uh the milky way behind me is rising in the east and you got the bright stars deneb and altair and vega up at the top that make up the summer triangle so that's a good i feeling that it's finally summer when you see the summer triangle up there and tari's over here to my up there is the bright star in scorpio the scorpius and you might see right there's the little hook right there of the scorpion it actually looks like a fish hook up there in the sky so thank you for taking the banner off the top there marty winkle my co-producer and running the Streamlabs program here today is we're going to talk a little bit about uh uh that it is the tw the moon is 23 days old so if you're an amateur astronomer you're excited about that because that means 23 days old hmm, it's going to rise well after one o'clock and then I'll be able to stargaze from sunset until I'm tired under dark skies. And uh, uh, so we'll talk about that here in a little bit here, about what is up to see in the summer skies, and particularly these faint fuzzies that we call the Messier objects. Who is Messier? We'll tell you about that in a second. And what are the faint fuzzies? Well, they're galaxies, they're star clusters, they're planetary nebula that have nothing to do with planets. They're stars that blew up and looked like a, a round planet in the telescopes uh, of days of old, back in the 18th century. And so we're also going to look at some of the latest web telescope images that have come down the pike as the web telescope has been operating now for over a year and boy is it just getting warmed up and it's expected 20 year history where it's going to revolutionize truly our concept of the universe well let's get started with that with a little bit of uh, space news to come on about the skylab telescope and uh, the, the solar telescope on Skylab, the Skylab space station. We're having the second crew going up here at the end of July. That would be the Skylab 2 crew where Jack Lausma, our good friend, was on that mission. Uh, and uh, with uh, Alan Bean was the commander, Jack Lausma. And then who was the third person on there, Marty? I'm putting you on the spot as I'm flying here on Skylab 2. Uh, uh, and, uh, oh, not, of course, Kerwin was on Skylab 1, and um, uh, Ed, uh, the other survivor of the 50-year career uh, of that, is on Skylab 3. Ed, Ed's last name, I keep forgetting Ed's. Uh, Marty's going to look it up for me there as I'm struggling there. But on July 11th, 1979, you space geeks out there know what was happening. Yep, the Skylab has fallen, says Chicken Little there, in one of the many things that were in society as the Skylab telescope uh, was coming out of Earth orbit. Uh, couldn't stop it. We didn't have the shuttle up in time. Skylab 2 was... You're going to tell me? Skylab 3. Sky 2 or 3. Well... It depends on if you're an engineer or a media. So the second crude Skylab. It would be uh, uh, Owen Garriott. Owen Garriott. No, Owen Garriott was the uh, commander of Skylab 3. No, no, he wasn't. I take that back. Yeah, right. Owen Garriott was the science officer on there with Jack Lausma and Commander Alan Bean, the moonwalker. That's right. So uh, Ed Gibson is surviving from the third Skylab crew mission that uh, is called Skylab 4 by engineers like Marty. So anyway, it fell. It was a real big deal. Society kind of had fun, but it was serious because it could have fallen on any major city in the world. And instead, it fell in the South Pacific and in the Western Australian outback where they found some of the big tanks that contained uh, oxygen and propellant and so forth did survive. And this tank ended up at the U.S. Uh, Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, in that picture I took uh, a few years ago. 
So uh, the Skylab was going to try to be saved by the space shuttle, but it didn't get flight worthy in time. Of course, the first flight in 1981, and Skylab fell back to Earth in 1979 after just being launched in 1973. But we'll be talking about the 50-year anniversary of the final two, two crews of Skylab. Uh, and uh, uh, Jack Lausmo may get Jack on a remote uh, Stay Curious program as he's been a good friend of the museum and have met Mr. Lausmo many times. So there is the moon at 23 days old. And we talked about this last week that the moon days tell astronomers uh, how much moonlight is going to be in the skies. So a 28-day moon cycle, all right, and so the seven-day-old moon, zero is new moon. So seven-day-old moon is first quarter. 14-day-old moon is full moon. 21-day-old moon is third quarter, and this is just a couple days uh, past uh, first quarter, so it's about a 23-day-old moon. And if you said that in astronomy circles, you'd be saying, all right, I can get my telescope out tonight and do some serious stargazing, finding some faint fuzzies because the moon's not out there tonight. The moon moonshine does drown out all these faint uh, uh, objects that we find in telescopes. And we'll explain some of those faint objects here as we explain this man, Charles Messier, all right, who in the late 1700s or the early 1800s was called the Comet Ferret. He was highly awarded. Uh, King of England uh, bequeathed him uh, the money to be the royal astronomer. And uh, all he simply did was try to find comets. All right. If you wanted to be famous back in the, the day of early astronomy, and we're talking the telescope basically invented by and popularized by Galileo, not invented, but popularized in 1609. And then come along the 1700s when William Herschel made a mirror telescope that become more popular because you could, uh, it was easier to make. So the reflecting telescopes got bigger and bigger, but this guy used about an eight to 10 inch telescope that many of us amateur astronomers have. I have several of that size to find these list of objects 105 of them called the Messier objects of the sky. Now, if you could find a comet, the comet could bear your name and you'd be eternally uh, remembered. Duh, Mr. Haley of uh, Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet predicted that a comet seen every 76 years through history would come back in a certain year and he died before that prediction. Nonetheless, they called that Haley's Comet. So, uh, uh, Messier discovered comets and these faint objects that didn't move in the sky from night to night. He knew were not comets because that's what a comet looked like, a faint fuzzy ball illuminated in the sky, but it would move. Uh, sometimes over the hours you could see it move against the background of the sky. And if no one had reported it before, bingo, you've discovered a comet and you can put your name on it. Well, all these objects on this famous poster of photographs of the Messier objects were were cataloged by him and, and and forever you know become a number and the M numbers Messier numbers and we're going to talk about M51 in his list of 105 objects uh, M1 is up there in the upper left hand corner that's the Crab Nebula very famous I think you all see the ring in there that's M uh, 57, the ring nebula of, of uh, Lyra the Harp. That's a summertime thing. So what we have here are galaxies uh, that they didn't know were galaxies with hundreds and billions of stars because only photographs revealed those in the early 1900s. So still they're thinking they're not, the true nature of these Messier objects was not even known until the beginning of the 20th century though Messier discovered many of them in the 18th century. Well, let's look at a couple of those in a minute. The Masters Astronomers Messier Journal by the Astronomical League, uh, or the, uh, you can chart 
and find all Messier objects with binoculars. There's even a binocular Messier list. Uh, but once you see them and record them in the logbook, you can get uh, a pen, which uh, I did uh, many, many years ago, of course. And there's my Messier pen. And you see, it begins with an M and ends with an R. And that Cyrillic writing is called a colophon. And if you hold that on edge on, you can see Messier's signature, all right, on this pin. And uh, it's a fun pin to get. There's all kinds of, not contests, but observing logs that you can do with the Astronomical League and the American Association of Amateur Astronomers, two organizations that promote stargazing uh, in a serious manner. So fun to do that. It's fun. It might take you years to do your Messier list. Or it could, you could do it maybe in one night in March when all of these objects are visible from sundown to sunrise. Uh, but it's quite challenging to find this list. It's quite rewarding. And that's, that's where you really cut your teeth in amateur astronomy and sort of can say, well, I'm an amateur astronomer now. I have my Messier lit logbook filled and my Messier pen. Then William Herschel, the great observing astronomer, he did a list of 500 objects, okay? So then you get more obsessed and you have to do your Herschel list of 500 objects. I've only done about 300 of those. Well, let's look at some of the objects you can find in the Big Dipper, which is just part of Ursa Major, the Big Bear, is you go out on these moonless nights because the moon is 23 days old. That means it's well after last quarter. It's in the after midnight sky. In fact, it's not going to rise tonight till about, oh, about a quarter after one Eastern Daylight Time. But there's the famous Big Dipper, seven stars, uh, the asterism in the sky. But you look around there, and you see between Fecta and Merrick on the bottom of the bowl is M97, the Owl Nebula. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. And then the Whirlpool Nebula is in the lower left, okay, uh, the last star of the handle is called Alcade. In M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, you jump down from there, bingo, you have found M51, Messier 51, the 51st object put in Messier's famous catalog again in the 1800s. So we're going to first look at the Owl Nebula through an amateur astronomy telescope, not very big scope. There, a sketch that uh, you could make, uh, black paper and then you use chalk or white ink to make your but even in a telescope it looks like it's got eyes on it and in a photograph those eyes even become more pronounced and yeah that kind of looks like a barn owl doesn't it marty the face of a barn owl and marty's not nodding or saying anything he, he doesn't see, see these things that that uh that uh, we can see in the sky but uh, that's the Owl Nebula because the eyes kind of look like an owl's eyes there uh, in a telescope. So astronomers have a big imagination, as you well know, creating all this mythology out of these points of light in the sky. But let's look at one that we're going to look at in depth, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And when this was first seen by Messier and sketched like this, it looks like a whirlpool drain down a sink, okay? And, but connected to it was another bright object that they couldn't figure what that was for uh, centuries until photography. But the whirlpool galaxy and sketches, uh, and then you can have reverse sketch where you're doing a positive on a negative, on white sheet of paper like here, all right? And they weren't sure what this feature was there that is connected, though the conjecture was there's two galaxies involved there. Well, my friend Mark Poole knows that the, the Bezier objects are the ones where you not only cut your teeth observing, but with astrophotography. Mark is part of our uh, Brevard Astronomical Society here. And he's just been an amateur astronomer about five years and got immediately involved in photography and does some wonderful work. Uh, and this is 31 million light years away, okay? So the light that he's capturing, these photons on his uh, digital camera, uh, and he take, you know, it's very sophisticated how he does this, but that light left 31 million years ago. 
So the dinosaurs died 61 million years ago. So the dinosaurs have been dead for over 30 million years when light from this galaxy left us. Now, if Mark Poole could have taken this photograph in the 1800s, he would have immediately been famous because he was going to show that the Whirlpool galaxy was a nebula, not a nebula, that they called it a nebula back here. Whirlpool Nebula is what it was technically called until they saw the star structures in the 1900s and they go, wait a minute, the Milky Way is not the entire universe. It's just one galaxy among thousands and thousands of galaxies in the universe. And we didn't know that until just 100 years ago, all right? People like Edwin Hubble, Harlow Shapley, okay, and Einstein were all uh, just realized that our Milky Way galaxy that we thought was the entire universe and had all the stars in the universe, no, it's just an island galaxy among thousands and hundreds of millions of galaxies, quite frankly. So just in a hundred years, mankind has been thinking that, that we are not alone galaxy-wise. Well, here's a beautiful shot, like I said, Mark Poole took, and then this is a Hubble telescope shot of the Whirlpool galaxy, one of the best ones ever taken. This galaxy, we seem to be looking right down on top of it. Some of the galaxies are edge on, some are three-quarter viewed, like the Andromeda galaxy that's nearby us. But here you have this galaxy interacted with another galaxy and ripped it apart, maybe. And we know that our, our Milky Way galaxy is headed to the Andromeda galaxy, and we're going to interact with each other in a several million years. But though it looks like there's a lot of stars there, that interaction could literally not even change our night sky, except for a few stars whizzing by, uh, whizzing by, I mean, in like a, a couple thousand year, hundred thousand year history there. So, uh, but there is the beautiful Whirlpool galaxy. The red areas are young nebulas that are creating stars. It's like you're watching fireworks going on uh, right in front of you as all these red areas indicate uh, birthing nurseries of stars that are hundreds of light years across. And then, of course, the bright center of the Whirlpool galaxy contains a black hole. Most galaxies do. This is also very similar to what our Milky Way galaxy would look like from down Look at that, uh, uh, excuse me, looking down from it, except it has some bars. It's got kind of like a a, a a bar in the middle. We don't know what causes that, where the arms are coming off of. Well, we've looked at the Whirlpool Galaxy in all three of NASA's great observatories, the Spitzer Space Telescope, the Hubble Telescope, and the Chandra X-ray Telescope. The Hubble and Chandra were taken to space by uh, space shuttles, all right, and the Spitzer was launched on a, uh, I think, a Delta IV rocket, or Delta V, or Atlas V, or Delta IV. Uh, look at the difference is the different light waves of the electromagnetic spectrum are being used at these different types of telescopes. The Hubble is seeing what the human eye would see, basically, all right. That is white light, which is just a small part of the big electromagnetic spectrum. You've seen that chart. All right, the visible universe is just very small, whereas the Spitzer is looking at uh, different radiative areas, including X-ray, I mean, not X-ray, um, gamma rays, and, and uh, uh, particularly focused towards the hydrogen in the uh, galaxy. And on the far right, in the Chandra X-rays, and X-rays are where energy is being released. In, in tremendous forms, like in a black hole. We can't see black holes, but we can see the energy being released around them. So as you're looking at the Chandra X-ray, it kind of looks like a rose petal. You see the bright areas of red in the, in the, in the uh, Hubble telescope correspond to these high energy places where stars are being born. And finally, completing the X-ray, of course, is the infrared. And infrared is uh, hot energy only. Infrared looks through cool areas and behind uh, cool clouds, and that is what the Webb telescope shown here is all about.
the Webb telescope over 21 feet in diameter compared to the Hubble just nine uh, feet in diameter is going to truly revolutionize uh, our world today. Marty, would you hand me my notes over there? I actually I, I printed my notes out and uh, they're on the uh, printer there and then didn't print them out, my friend. So we're going to look at here is M51, Messier's 51. OK, uh, through the Webb telescope. Uh, the web took decades to design. All right, I wanted to set you up here and build, but that Herculean effort is already paying off. This multi-billion dollar observatory, scarcely a year on the job, but it's already sending back stunning cosmic vistas, complete with uh, an unbelievable amount of scientific data that has helped scientists advance their understanding of the universe already. The telescope may operate for over 20 years, but let's look at some of the highlights of the Webb's first years on the job, so to speak. And there is the Hubble telescope on the left and the Webb on the right showing you the intense infrared images by the heated parts of this galaxy. And this is a M75, and this is what astronomers are calling the bones of this galaxy. You're actually looking at the infrared structure that uh, is the heat signature of, of, of all the spiral arms and so forth. Very similar galaxy to M51, the Whirlpool galaxy. And right there in the dead center is a black hole in that whitest of white area there. Quite a spectacular image from the web as we look at some of the spectacular images from its first year. Now, we be become accustomed to these images where a telescope like the Hubble or the Webb keeps looking in an area of the sky that they thought was completely dark and black and nothing there. And lo and behold, they find thousands of galaxies there. Now, the Hubble did this in a little area of, of uh, uh, Ursa Major. This is an area of Virgo that the Webb telescope has done that's seemingly looking into nothingness and yet you see thousands and thousands of not stars but galaxies filled with stars. Now the the uh, the bright areas that have the hexagonal bars through them, the star uh, crosses, those are stars in our galaxy right between the Webb telescope and these distant uh, galaxies being seen there. So there's one, two, three, four, five, a couple at the top, where those are stars in our galaxy. Everything else, including the bright object in the center, is a galaxy. And some of these galaxies go back to over 10 billion light years away in our 15 billion uh, old universe. All right. Time, uh, we measure distance and time as we go back in time. And we're truly looking at this spectacular image here. You've got galaxies that are warped because their light is actually coming from behind a galaxy and the Einstein effect of light bending, of gravity bending light is proven on images like this. Then we have one of the most famous images of the Hubble taken by the web. This is the Pillars of Creation. And it looks like it's broken up in compared to the Hubble image you're familiar with because those cold clouds, the web is actually looking through right there in the middle and see star structures behind it that we couldn't see uh, and the, uh, with the Hubble. And see these uh, four stars in the lower right there and that one star in the middle of the opening and there's another one up at the top those are all new stars that have been born out of this tremendously huge gas cloud in our milky way galaxy all right this is in our own milky way galaxy and uh this is uh, uh, uh over a hundred uh a thousand light years away from us okay but this whole structure, Marty, is seven light years from top to bottom. Now, keep in mind the nearest star to our star, our sun, is four light years away. So this is twice the distance of Earth and of the closest star to the, our sun. 
Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away. That gives you a perspective of how huge this is. And what is going on there is the creation of just not stars, but entire solar systems of stars with their own planets. Well, the Webb Telescope has done something that the Hubble couldn't do in this detail, show the birth of a star. A protostar, they're calling this, at the very center of this hourglass. As this star is ignited and is blowing away the, the uh, gaseous matter around it, all right, clearing it away like the sun clearing away fog on a, on a summer morning as the fog is being dissipated. That's what's going on here on this protostar in the center, the birth of a star happening before our eyes. And then just the antithesis of it is the death of a star that the Webb telescope photographed in these two images, the infrared image on the left, and then infrared with some other filters on it on the right, showing in the center a star that blew up but just kind of belched its layers first, and then it may had a major catastrophic uh, explosion. And the major catastrophic explosion, the speed of the material is faster than the original burp of the explosion, kind of the warm-up. So these are all interacting as they caught up with each other, and rarefied gases are slamming into each other. But this is the end. This is uh, the, the, the solar cycle from the web here's the birth of a star and here's the death of a star well web is just not looking at the universe as far as it can or our our milky way galaxy and things like the uh, pillars of creation we just saw it's also looking at the planets probably won't look at the the moon because it's too bright and it has to stay away from the sun because the sun could fry its optical system but it did look at Jupiter recently, and there you see Jupiter, the, our largest object in our solar system. Everything can fit inside of it, of Jupiter. Keep that in mind. Every planet, all the rings, all the 200 moons can fit inside this globe comfortably. As you see, the red spot uh, is not red, of course. It's infrared in this picture. And you just barely see, you see a couple of its moons, all right? You see an aurora diffraction, they're calling. The southern aurora is quite bright, and it uh, creates a, a line across the image taken by the Webb Telescope digital cameras. Um, but you see a faint ring uh, on the left there. Jupiter has a ropey ring around it, like a hula hoop, okay? So... All of the four gaseous planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all have rings. And uh, we still don't know exactly what caused them. Are they a moon that came too close and got tore apart? That could happen. That's called the Roche, Roche limit. Uh, uh, it was a asteroid captured and torn apart by the uh giant planet we don't know we don't know how long these rings are is this what saturn's rings will be leveled to or, or just a roping a mass going around there well here is saturn's rings taken just june 25th a couple weeks ago uh and because the I, the tops of jupiter's clouds are 200 below zero that's cold so that looks dark in an infrared image it's just looking for heat or bright light and it's getting plenty of heat and light signature off of the bright rings that are made mostly of rock colored uh, covered ice or ice uh, 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 you know rocks covered by ice uh, and a lot of ice in these systems the rings are there you see a couple of the moons of Jupiter you see some uh, uh, different areas of the rings including Cassini's division is what they call the big division in the middle there. Keep in mind the rings are from Earth to the moon in distance, okay? But they're so thin that if that Earth to the moon distance was a sheet of paper, all right, the uh, 20 miles wide, a sheet of paper 20 miles wide, the rings are that thin. They're that thin of one sheet of paper 20 miles wide all right that is a unbelievably tenuous relationship yet we don't know if these rings have lasted for a million years 
maybe 50,000 years. We, uh, certainly they can't be that fresh and mankind just seeing them by happenstance or maybe they're maybe they're a billion years old in our four billion year old uh, uh, solar system. We just don't know. We need to come back and get some pieces of, of the range to understand what they are. And the Webb Telescope has looked at Neptune, technically the last planet in our solar system, the eighth planet, if you discount Pluto, and which I never will, okay? I'm a big Pluto fan, so we want to keep Pluto. Uh, so I, I wonder, I've never asked Tom Usiak if he's a Pluto planet or not. I'll bet Robert Law wants to still keep Pluto in its planetary status. It's a dwarf planet, and for rightfully so, we'd either have to add five or six dwarf planets to the eight planets in the solar system or create a whole new class and so i think it was a good idea but they should have just kept pluto in there uh hope uh, maurice krasowski agrees with me carlton bailey's watching cynthia rossi and dave staying here watching we got space monkeys out there sandy parks as a uh, author is uh, enjoying stay curious i hope uh, Chalad Zan's watching. Thank you, sir. Doug Forrest is uh, staying curious today. And Hazel Banks is always curious there at her home on Merritt Island. Bill Whiting is watching. Bill, I think you might be watching out there, standing in line to get uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, get, get a signature there from Bakes. All right. Uh, O.C. Walker's watching and Tom Celentano. Thank you, guys. But, yeah, Bill, you're, you're out there watching, uh, getting an autograph from uh, Mike Baker out there, a great guy. Connie McDaniel, a.k.a. Hazel. She's also out there, I think, getting an autograph from uh, Mike Baker, uh, who Marty and I are going to have dinner with tonight. He wants to show us some, see the museum, and we will uh, record a Stay Curious with him when he comes back next week, Marty. Probably work out, uh, maybe... He's going to be here next Saturday and Sunday, I believe. So uh, uh, so thank you all for watching. This is a cool photo that the Webb Telescope took. We've never seen uh, Uranus or Neptune like this. And then Triton is this, its a, a Mercury-sized moon that could have life on it in the oceans that are under a big ice layer there. So, so we've shown you a little bit about the, the Webb Telescope, uh, and uh, you're not going to see the images like that from your backyard, but you will see this tonight from your backyard. You're going to see the planet Venus keeps getting lower in the sky. This is about uh, right at sunset, uh, uh, about 8 o'clock, shortly after sunset, still in the twilight. Mars is above Venus, and there's another star right close to Mars. It's actually brighter than Mars. What is that? That is Regulus in the bright star in Leo the Lion. So go out there after uh, this will be gone by 930 at night. Venus will be gone, Regulus and Mars will be gone. And if you look at Venus through a telescope, it will have a crescent phase, kind of like the 23-day-old moon we're, we're looking at uh, if you get up early uh, and uh, go out and look before sunrise. You'll see the moon in your morning sky out there. So that's where we're going to look going look into the west okay after sunset venus mars and the star regulus close to each other and as you look to the east at 8 30 9 o'clock at night as we have in my green screen behind me here marty the solar system i mean the milky way is rising behind us there you see here you've got the cloudiness of the Milky Way in Sagittarius and Scorpio, where the star Antares is. And then to the north, you have three constellations that have three bright stars in them, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. They obviously make a triangle. It's called the Summer Triangle. Now, Deneb is the at the top of the cross of Cygnus the Swan. And then Vega is a parallelogram, I think you can see there, a, a rectangle whopper jawed a little bit of four stars. Vega is in Lyra the harp, as indeed that does look like a harp, you know, uh, that the ancients played for entertainment. And then Altair is in Aquila the eagle, and it's another star pattern that looks like a cross there. 
So uh, the summer triangle is rising just above the horizon. As the night wears on, it's going to get higher and higher. As the Earth keeps going on its orbit around the sun, it's going to get higher and higher on, uh, at the same hour of the night. So if you go out at 9 o'clock at night a month from now, this will all be considerably about uh, a quarter of the way, uh, halfway up from overhead to the sky there. Your Milky Way, you'll see a hint of it maybe from your backyard if you're doing some backyard stargazing. But you need to get in a darker area where there's no light pollution to see it at its best. So hope you can get out and get a little starlight over the weekend, over the weekdays here, as this is an opportune time all week uh, to see some what we those Messier objects uh, or take your star chart, learn with your red flashlight because your red flashlight won't hurt your eyes uh, that have uh dilated as you've been out in the sky and it's so so important to give yourself a good 10 minutes out there in your lawn chair with your star chart comfortably looking at the stars up in the sky as you uh can learn the constellations and kind of star hop around and you got cygnus you got lyra the harp like we talked about to the north you got the big dipper uh, of course, the Little Dipper is right where the North Star is on his tail. Hercules is another great constellation. Maybe we'll talk about Hercules next month because it's an actually very large constellation directly overhead in this picture here of the night sky. And it kind of looks like SpongeBob SquarePants to me as it has a distinctive square uh, shape to it there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, those of you uh, way south. We're still got uh, Ophiuchus, uh, Scorpio, uh, and uh, Sagitta, the arrow to, to look at. Delphinus is up there, the dolphin in our summer sky. Uh, and as you look to the North Cephas, the king is uh, also up there. So to learn the constellations is to do a little homework before you go out under the stars. Then with your red flashlight that uh, you can just take cellophane find you some red cellophane and put them around the lights so indispensable as you sit and look at the stars make sure your neighbor's street lights are blocked out uh, uh, with the building or whatever and uh, it's kind of challenging to look and stargaze from your own backyard but you can do it and it's very rewarding and fun to do now one other thing that's going on in our atmosphere uh, during the daytime, not in our atmosphere, but, during, but speaking of our atmosphere, any time you could see a meteor strike through, it is a meteoroid, a piece of space debris when it's in outer space, a meteoroid it is a meteor when it burns up in our atmosphere, and when you pick it up on the ground, it is a meteorite. So hopefully you see some meteors as we're getting towards the... the Perseid meteor shower will be about a month from now in August, and uh, but there's all every all there's meteor showers going on all the time. That's where the Earth's orbit is going through well-known space debris from comets or asteroids that have been left, uh, and then you have this sporadic meteor that you just might be enjoying and getting your eyes adapted and learning where Aquila is up there. Uh, and all of a sudden you see a streak go by and there's always fun to think about and watch well in the daytime we can see our star but I don't want you looking at it with with anything uh, except uh, a quick look uh, not even a quick look try not to look at the Sun it can damage your eyesight instantly Binoculars, do not look with binoculars, do not look uh, with any kind of telescope if you don't know what you're doing. These astronomer did, this is actually an astronomer in, uh, uh, around here, oh, Ocala, Florida, actually posted this picture. Today's sun today, there's a gigantic sunspot that's going to start going across the sun's uh, surface. The sun takes 30 days to rotate once around. So when we're seeing a spot just appear like we're at the lower left, it will take over a week to get to the other side of the sun. So it's a great opportunity to look safely at the sun. If you do have solar eclipse classes from the last greatest solar eclipse, you may look at them with that. Uh, but total disclaimer, 
don't sue us if you look at the sun because you shouldn't but astronomers are looking at it and you can see that bright uh, that dark sunspot which are cooler areas of the sun caused by electromagnetic rays so that spot has thrown something into space that can uh, two or three days reach the earth and electromagnetic energy pulls the magnetism in at the poles and we see aurora borealis or astrealis so uh, the sun's very active in its uh, 11 year cycle and sunspots like this as you see it pepper in the sun there could disrupt our communications in some ways as this is electromagnetic energy affecting the earth from time to time so we'll talk more about that over the summer as we see these sunspots uh, come and go well, hope that you've all enjoyed a little bit of backyard astronomy with me, Stargazer Mark. I've got a camera here to remind me that if I put it on a tripod, set the ISO or sensitivity very high, like well over 2,000, or some of these cameras will even go up to 10,000, that increases the sensitivity. Put it on a tripod, find yourself timer, because if you mash the button, it'll jiggle the camera and shake up your views but if you put it on self timer five ten seconds push the button and open up to a 30 second exposure at a very high iso like 5000 you won't believe what you can get and don't delete anything in the field wait till you see your images when you download them but you can do some pretty decent astrophotography just a 30 second exposure and that is short enough that the earth's motion doesn't make the stars blur on you so go out and have fun with your digital camera capturing some star shine out there i'm going to do the same over all week get out underneath there uh, underneath the, our canopy of the universe and find me some messier objects those faint fuzzies that we love to chase so hope that you can get out and do a little bit of stargazing from your backyard and tomorrow marty we are going to have a guest with us uh and uh, I didn't bring his name with me. His name is uh, Kevin. Kevin Hofstadter. Okay, Kevin Hofstadter helped build the space shuttle main engines. He knows all about them. He's got a cool model he's going to bring, and you're going to learn everything you want to know about the space shuttle main engines. Why do they apply now? Because they're the same engines that Artemis is going to use on at least four missions, as they had 18 engines left over. Artemis is going to use four of them. Artemis 1 dumped four of them in the Atlantic Ocean. Artemis 2, when it launches a year from November, fingers crossed, will have another four of those space shuttle main engines on them. And uh, we're going to hear all about them tomorrow for you to stay curious. Marty, thank you for another great job on Streamlabs. We didn't have any of the hiccups that we've had, so maybe we've got that problem solved. Uh, so, but we're glad that you're with us today, whether we have problems or not. We have a very faithful group of you out there watching. Please tell your friends uh, to watch so we can start exponentially increasing the viewership of Stay Curious. Not for me, but for our museum, because that's how we can turn a buck on YouTube and make some money by helping you stay curious. So, until tomorrow with a great program about the Space Shuttle Main Engine. I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.